Colossians chapter 3, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection or completion. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul begins this section, and the New King James translates it, if then you were raised with Christ, and then he goes on. This is the turning point that Paul has in many of his epistles, from the theological truths to the practical application of those truths. If you've been here uh, for very long, you've heard me uh, use the expression, the so what principle. We can interpret the scriptures and should in all the different ways, linguistically and culturally and theologically and uh, in the context of its time and culture. But ultimately, if that's all we do, we're just gathering information. We have to come to the place of saying, okay, I understand all that, so what? What does that mean in my life? How do I make application to that. Here in verse 1, he says, if, which in the Greek language doesn't mean maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, one of the Greek scholars who I read, because I don't read Greek, but fortunately he writes in English, um, he translates it as in view of the fact, therefore, that you were raised with Christ. That's the sense of this. This isn't saying, well, if, if you might, if maybe. No, it's since would be a common way to, to write it. Since you were raised with Christ. Because that's already an established fact in your life. I realize as I've considered, as I've been teaching over the last several months especially, I have a habit of continually encouraging you to understand what the basic truth is of your salvation. I challenged you to 
memorize Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. So now I'm going to call on someone. Ooh, you didn't think I was going to do that, huh? No, I'm not going to do that. But it has the essence and the truth that we want to build upon. For you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that he appointed beforehand. That's the truth. That's the truth. And if we can keep that in front of our consciousness at all times and let that be the foundation that we build on, we talk about it in men's group, which uh, any men that weren't able to come, you missed out because Saturday morning it was, it was a blessing. And the next one is coming up next Tuesday in the evening. We're doing alternating uh, evenings and mornings so that we catch everybody who can. Come on out. It's, it's a blessing. But we talked about the fact of laying the foundation. Paul says, no other foundation can be laid except that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. But that's not just some mystical symbol of something. It is we need to build our lives on the truth of, well, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 is the truth of what Jesus has done, what God has done through Jesus in this world and in us. And if we build on that first, not making other stuff up or thinking about God as the, the bad guy or the lenient guy or whatever, but that understanding of it, then what we build with has a solid foundation in our lives. <coughs> and that's what Paul is saying here. Hey, because this is true, because you have been raised with Christ, because you have been raised with Christ, Jesus experienced physical resurrection. And because of that, we can experience spiritual resurrection. It became a potential at Jesus' resurrection that we could be spiritually revived. It wasn't possible before then. It, there, was no, there wasn't the potential energy, so to speak, that could be activated into kinetic energy to actually happen. But rather, at his resurrection, now there is that potential, and it becomes actual when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. It's by faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. It's his gift, okay? So... That's where we are in this. Um, on Saturday, I think it was, it was John who encouraged us, uh, John Murray, who encouraged us at one point, and I think a couple of the guys were like, amen, preach it, brother. And it, the, one of the things that jumped into my mind uh, was he talked about the fact that we have all been awakened in the sense that in our being born again, it's like we become awakened. And then my mind went back to uh, what I used to do uh, late nights, uh, Fridays, as a, as a young uh, pre-adolescent in watching Chili Billy Cardilly, uh, or Saturday afternoons where there was, uh, you'd always, you could always find a sci-fi movie. Uh, they were terrible. They were all black and white, which it didn't matter because we only had a black and white TV anyway. You know, it was when color was like, Oh, that'll never catch on. Um, but, um, and so sometimes I think in those modes, and I suddenly got this thought, I didn't say anything in, in the men's group because I didn't want to divert it into this weird thing. But anyway, I, I thought about this thought. If, if you can imagine this sci-fi movie where they put everybody in suspended animation so that they can travel to a galaxy far, far away and wake up and not be any older and so forth. And I imagine that that's how we all are before Christ. We are in these tubes in suspended animation. And Jesus is walking through and he's calling our name. And for those who respond, who hear and respond by faith in him, you know, boom, the tube opens up and the wispy smoke comes out and we rise up. It's what it is. We have been awakened. There's a lot of people in this world who are still in their tubes asleep. They have not awakened. They have not heard his voice. He's been calling. 
He's been calling them by name, but they have not yet heard and responded. But we have. You're awake now. You've been awakened. Because of that, since you have been raised with Christ, given new life, not just trying to find a way to change the old life, you've been given new life. That's what Paul is telling us right here. Since you were raised with Christ, seek those things that are above. And the, 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 the Greek again here is kind of interesting in the way this one scholar identified it. The way he translated it is, the things above be constantly seeking. And that sounds a little bit like Yoda from Star Wars, doesn't it? It's kind of got the sentence backwards in the way I think. But that's the sense of the phrase, because the emphasis is not on what we do. The emphasis is on what we're looking for and what we're seeking. The thing that is above, be constantly seeking. That's the sense of it. He says in verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. I think it's the old King James who, who says, set your affections on that. What are the things that you think about? What are the things that um, make your heart go? What are the things that you are seeking towards? What are the things that you set your mind and your heart upon? And Paul is saying, set it on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Boy, you know, you got to get up in the morning. You got to, you know, be nice enough to all your neighbors to take a shower, put on some clean clothes. Then you got to get up and eat and if you have kids in the house you've got to care for them or so forth if, if you're living alone you've got to make sure everything's taken care of before you go out of the house and you maybe you go to work maybe you go to school maybe you're retired whatever it is you've got all these things to do and we are thinking and we're living on this plane and we're thinking on this plane and we have to but we cannot and we should not Set our affections, set our mind on these things. This is just the stuff we got to do to walk through this world. But where we want to set our affections is on the things above all of this. That's what Paul is challenging us to do. Set your affection on the things above, not on the things of this world. And on above, notice he says where Jesus is. You remember the whole Gnostic thing and the emanations and the separation between us and God and you can't get close to God or anything. And Paul's blowing that away throughout, saying, no, Jesus, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, right? There's nothing in between. We sang it this morning. Is that last song we sang awesome? Get a bulletin if you didn't take one and look at those words and consider them and let them be an encouragement to you. Man, that's a that powerful piece of writing. I don't know who wrote it, but I do know who wrote it. The Holy Spirit of God. And at the end of that, there is nothing in between. See, we think there is. We feel that there is. And sometimes we place things in between us and God. We place this plain the world between us and God and we place it there he doesn't and as we seek him and as we surrender to him he will take those things out of the way and in some cases we got to do some of the lifting and that's what Paul gets into in the rest of the passage that we're going to look at today three actions last week we talked about three lies this week, we're talking about three actions that Paul identifies in this passage of Scripture. He says in verse 5, after, okay, because since you're raised with Christ, verse 5, therefore, okay, because of that, put to death your members which are on the earth. 
Now, I'm a pastor of a church. He's not saying I should put to death the members of Calvary Chapel of Pittsburgh. Okay? In the same way, he's not saying you should do some weird thing and impose some bodily pain or injury to yourself to put to death the members of your body. But there's a real putting to death here. Absolutely. And the word is, is, in the Greek is powerful in that way. Put it to death. Kill it. You see, we as believers sometimes fall into the idea that we want to endure temptation and run from the trials. Endure the temptation, but run from the trials. It's exactly opposite. We are called numerous times in the New Testament to run from temptation. Flee from it. Don't look back at all. Don't say, wait, goodbye. Just run as fast as you can. But the trial, well, the trials that we go through, as believers in Jesus Christ, they don't touch us unless the Lord allows it. A pastor friend of mine used to call it, everything is Father filtered in our lives. And we have trouble orienting our mind around that because it's not all rosy. We thought God was good and He'd only give us good gifts and rosy things. Make us happy and sweet and sing songs. Doesn't it say we're supposed to be singing songs at the end of this passage and stuff, right? But man, sometimes the things that we are enduring, I don't feel like singing. Or the song that I sing will never make the top 40. God is the one who places us in those trials. Oh, I know, we could get into all sorts of theological gyrations to say, well, God is good and He doesn't cause evil and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, all true, but forget about that. Don't wrestle your brain around that. The Scripture is clear that through whatever means that He does it, God puts us in the midst of trials and There's someone next to us in the fire. Do you know the story that that's based on? Jesus, that Krista talked a little bit about it. It's the story of the three Hebrew children who were transported from Jerusalem into Babylon uh, in the Babylonian captivity in the first wave where they took the smartest and brightest and best looking and best fit young people to Babylon out of Jerusalem in order to establish them and teach them the Babylonian ways. Send them to Babylonian University. That was the way the Babylonians dealt with their enemies. If they didn't annihilate them, they would take control of them and then they would take their best and brightest, bring them to Babylonian or Babylon U, put them through the course of study, get them all oriented to that, and then with the idea of putting them back so someone from their own culture was indoctrinated into Babylonian culture and teaching and wisdom and knowledge, and then that would influence that generation and the further generations of the area that they overtook. That was, that was their plan, and that's why they took uh, the three Hebrew children and Daniel there as young men. And you remember the story, Nebuchadnezzar uh, had had a dream and Daniel interpreted the dream, and it had to do with a large uh, you know, structure, a large uh, uh, idol kind of thing uh, made out of different stuff. And after that, uh, it doesn't say explicitly, but I believe Nebuchadnezzar thought, oh good, I, I'll make an idol of myself, a nice big tall gold idol, just like the one I dreamed about, only it'll be me. And so he did it, and it was this huge thing, and he called everybody to come and bow down before it. When the trumpet blows, bow down before this idol. And three Hebrew children said, Nuh-uh, we will not. We will not bow before it. And he threatened them. And they said, Our God will deliver us from whatever you do to us because he was threatening to put them, to burn them alive. There was evidently a a fire which was not untypical for some idols built in that day where they would actually have a fire underneath the, the actual idol if it was made out of uh, metal of some sort. 
And they would offer sacrifices underneath. And he was threatening to burn them alive in there. And they said, our, our God will deliver us. And even if he doesn't, no way. We're not bowing down. And boy, that made Nebuchadnezzar mad. And it says, he set the fire seven times hotter. So much so that the ones who after binding these Hebrew boys and taking them to throw them in, they were burned from the fire. The guards were. They threw them in the, in the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar is looking. Nebuchadnezzar is an interesting character. He was a very religious guy. And, and this is known through all of the, the archaeological stuff and so forth. You can read the history. He was a very religious guy. And he had the habit of whatever peoples he would overrun and whatever religion or gods they, they worshipped, he would build a temple to, to that god too. So he had temples to all the different gods either in Babylon or nearby. So he was kind of covering his bases all over. So he was concerned about these guys who said, our god will deliver us. He was mad enough to kill him, but he was also a little bit concerned about, eh, but mm, what happens if this god gets mad at me? And so he's looking in, and what does he see? He says, I see them walking about and they are no longer bound, and I see a fourth with them, one who has the appearance of the Son of Man. And when they brought the Hebrew children out, their bonds had been, was the only thing that was destroyed by that fire. And it says, you could not even smell smoke on them. That's amazing. And it is such a truth for every one of us. He will always be there with you in the fire. And the fire intended to destroy them. The only thing it destroyed was the things that were holding them bound. And there's a powerful spiritual truth in that for every one of our lives. The trials that we go through, God uses them to free us. To free us. It doesn't mean it's nice when you're in the midst of them. <laughs> no. But he never leaves nor forsakes. And he is there with us. Put to death the members which are on the earth. But then he identifies specific things. And this is what he's saying. And in a sense, he's saying these things should already be dead. These things should already be dead. Verse 3 said, you have died. That's also a past tense. For you have died. You're already dead. And then he names these things. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And some translations don't have the, the last four ver uh, words there uh, coming upon the sons of disobedience, but it's coming. The wrath is, of God is coming. And if you don't believe it, read uh, the book of Revelation from about chapter 5 on, and you'll, you'll see plenty there. The wrath of God is coming. But we, have, we are no longer children of wrath. We have been... Uh, put in the kingdom of his son so we're no longer subject to his wrath okay put these things to death fornication comes from the greek word porneia from which we get pornography but the word in the greek is all encompassing it is any illicit sexual intercourse whether that is sex outside of marriage whether that is adultery whether that is homosexuality, whether that is bestiality, whether that is whatever ality someone could come up with in the sinful mind that is illicit sexual intercourse. That's what that's talking about. That's what that word means. He says, put it to death. Now remember that Colossae was a pagan town. And uh, pagans in that day practiced all sorts of lifestyles that were acceptable generally to the society of the day. And Paul's saying, no, put it to death. Put it to death. Don't just play with it. Don't just cut back a little bit. I'll only commit adultery 
four times a week instead of my usual six. No, it's not a wean yourself off of sin. It's a kill it. Kill it dead. You're already dead. It should be dead too. Kill it. Kill it. Put it to death. Uncleanness. And this can be thought of in a couple of different ways. It's, it brings forth the idea of the ceremonial uncleanness uh, within the temple. You remember if you, brought a, if you brought an animal to offer and sacrifice at the temple, the priest would approve whether it was clean or not, whether it was uh, worthy of being sacrificed unto God. There were certain actions that could make you unclean. If you touched a dead body, if you touched someone else's blood, if you had a discharge from your body, you couldn't enter into the temple until you became clean. So there are lots of things morally that can cause us to be unclean. Now, remember, we no longer live in the temple days. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have been raised with Christ. The Holy Spirit already abides within you. And so we, as the temple, we want to keep the temple clean. But we don't chase the Holy Spirit out of our temple when we become somewhat unclean. That's one of the differences between the Old Testament and New Testament concept here. It doesn't mean it's okay to let our temple become unclean. But it means we don't have to get saved all over again because we got unclean and God left and now we ask, ask Him to forgive us again. We do have to ask Him to forgive us, of course. But that's not a matter of the fact that He hasn't already forgiven us. It's a matter of agreeing with God that this is something that we need forgiveness for. Right? It's different. Keep that truth. Keep that foundation there. Uncleanness. Passion. And, and the word there, you know, the idea of passion is, um, what, are you, what are you passionate about? And, and this is within the concept of uh, evil passions. This is not saying we shouldn't be passionate people. David, King David, was a passionate man. Read about him. In all of his ways, he was passionate. He was passionate about his God from an early age as a teenager, young boy. He's saying, what, everybody in the army is afraid of this 9-foot, 15-foot guy? No big deal. If God's on our side, why are you guys all cowering? Okay, well, we'll give you a sword and a shield and armor and stuff. No, no, no. All I need is my slingshot and the Lord. He's that passionate about his faith. And his passions in some areas of his life were directed to the wrong things, like his experience with Bathsheba. But by nature, he was a passionate man. You can read that when you read about King David. And what did the Lord say about him? Man, this guy's the apple of my eye. As a matter of fact, the Messiah will be known as a son of David. Wow. That's saying something. We're not to become impassionate robots. But this is talking about the evil passions of this world. Evil desire. Yeah, that's pretty obvious. Covetousness. The interesting thing here is the word here is not just talking about possessions and money. I want. I want. I want. I want. I can find it. I could buy it right now while I'm preaching. <laughs> wow. We live in a society today here in America that to a large degree, the success of our economy is based upon the covetousness of human beings. And marketing ads are designed to stimulate that covetousness. You could be just like that person in the ad, if you were driving that car, you'd look just like them, right? Oh, they don't say that, but they say that, right? The whole thing is built on that, and it's become so easy to just, I could buy something from Amazon right now, but I'm not going to. 
But it's not just talking about, okay, well, okay. Pastor said Amazon's evil. We should never do it. No, it's not that. Where are you setting your mind? Where are you setting your passions? Where are you setting your heart? Set it on the things above, not on the things here. That's the foundation of everything Paul's saying here. So put that all to death because anything, and I believe this covetousness word could apply to all of the things before it. You can be covetous about sex and sexual relations so that you'll just go get it anywhere, anytime. That's wrong. That's wrong. You can be covetous about the things that you want. The evil desires that are aiming towards things. And putting any one of those things between us and God is idolatry. We begin to worship that. We begin to ascribe more worth to that thing than to God. We might not ever say that out of our mouth, but our actions speak louder than our words. So the first thing to do is put some stuff to death. Kill it. The second action that we're called to do starts uh, there in... Um, yeah, I lost my, my place here. Yeah, okay. Uh, verse 8. But now, and notice what he says here, you yourselves... There's, there's, he's kind of making an emphasis there. He didn't just say you. He said you yourselves. You yourselves are to put off all of these. And, and we'll go through them. This is similar to the uh, book of Ephesians talks about this. Put off the old man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man. It's the same same idea, the same teaching with slightly different words here. So there's an action of putting off. There's one thing, we're putting something to death. But now, we're taking something off. It's a, it's a matter of will, and it's a matter that will happen more than once in your life, that you'll have to take off that coat of anger, or that coat of malice, or that coat of lying or any of the other things that he talks about there. And it's a matter of us finding the way to get it off. For the last uh, two weeks, and I guess for maybe three or four more, uh, on, on Tuesdays, uh, Krista takes care of uh, one of our grandsons, Teddy, uh, Kelly and, and uh, Kibo's um, boy, three years old. And due to some scheduling things and so forth. She's also taking care of uh, Casey and Abby's um, youngest boy, okay? He's two years old, right? So Declan and Teddy are together and, and they, are, they are just a blast. You know, this grandparent thing is awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. And these two boys, although they are a year apart, developmentally, neither of them is behind, so to speak, but developmentally, they're at a good place that they like hanging out with each other now. And um, it, it's just hysterical watching them uh, during the day as they, as they do different things. And um, Krista sends, we, we have a, a texting group for all of the kids in, in my family. Um, and so on Tuesdays, we get these videos and these pictures that are just, you know, people hear me laughing out loud at work. I'm sure they think I'm the old crazy guy, you know? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, so let me go earlier than at the end of the year, <laughs> since I'm crazy. But there, there, was, there was one this last week, um, where uh, Declan and Teddy are there and they're standing there and declan he's got this kind of tough nature. He walks like this. He just does. I don't know where it came from. And, and uh, uh, Teddy is, is, they're both just wonderful. Here I go. I'm a gaga grandparent, right? And I'm going on and on. So Declan's there and he looks at Teddy. They're playing about something. He looks at him 
And Krista caught this on, on the video, and he says, Teddy, I love you. And Teddy looks at him, and he goes, see my new shoes? <laughs> And what's funny, a a Abby, Declan's uh, mom, put, it, put an answer to that and said, well, you know, it's funny because Declan has never had new shoes. He keeps inheriting Teddy's because, you know, or <laughs> with all the kids in the family, you know, passing them around, and those will be his one day. It's kind of funny. But I came home early one day, and I was there, and the boys were still there, and I, I got them up from, uh, or got Teddy up from his nap. Declan was already up got him up from his nap, and, uh, you know, he, he needed to change his clothes and so forth. And he's still not at that place where he, knew how, he knows how to get himself dressed. You know, he has a tough time with it, and, you know, it, you got you got to help him with it. it. It's tough. Here he is. He's three years old, but he's still, you know, he's, he's trying to put one, both legs in one pant leg, and, you know, he's like, you know, you know, try putting your shoes on and, and you know, he, he comes and he gives them to you and says, I, I can't do it. You know, he's got to learn, you know, and it's totally normal and everything else. But, you know, doesn't know how to put on or take off his clothes. And we are in the same place in a lot of ways in how do we put off the old man? How do we put off these things? We have to learn. We have to teach ourselves. This is one of the things in, in having small group fellowship, like the men's fellowship or the women's fellowships, and having the opportunity to have some time to talk together about who we are and what our lives are like and stuff that we're going through. And we learn from one another through the Word, by His Spirit and one another. Okay, well, how, how did you do that? Or you know, we get tips and tricks on how to live this Christian life and how to put off these things, right? We have to learn. We have to learn. Now, you yourselves are to put off all these, okay? All, not just, you know, pick your favorite two, all of them, okay? Anger, and the word here, the idea is anger that is just always there. You ever know somebody who, who just... Underneath the surface, there's just, there's just a brewing anger that is there. And uh, I, I knew one guy at work at one time years ago. And it was just always there. And, and it would come out, even if, he wasn't, uh, even if he wasn't boiling up over, he never had anything good to say about anything. Right? Everything was, was a problem. Everything was a complaint. Boy, you know, it's, it's sunny outside today. Yeah, it's probably going to get to be too hot. I mean, that would be the kind of thing you would, I would expect to hear from him, right? It's like, gosh, you wonder why nobody wants to hang out with you, you know? But it's, it was part of his nature of just that, that anger. Paul says, take that off. You can't just say, well, that's just the way I am. No, take it off. How? Well, you, need, you yourself need to figure it out and get it off in the strength of the Lord. He gives you the desire, he gives you the ability, but he's telling us right here, you yourself, put off that anger. Get rid of it. The next one is related to it. Wrath. Wrath is that explosion that comes from anger. That explosion of someone who's, you know, just kind of, hanging out pretty mild manner and something happens and brrr, the Hulk comes out, right? I was that way. I imagine that some certain things in certain situations might still rise that up, but I've been putting that off for many, many, many years. But I was that, you know, and you say, well, gosh, Pastor, you seem pretty laid back and so forth, and I am. There are certain things that would, you know, either build up in me or something the particular thing and man i could be that wrath could come flying out and a lot of times it wouldn't last long it was just kind of this and then mild-mannered banner comes back right <laughs> gotta put that off gotta put that off is what paul says here malice that's just 
evil scheming against people. That concept of always looking out for how can I, how can I get even? How can I take care of this or whatever? That those thoughts of evil against others. Blasphemy. Now this one's a very interesting one because blasphemy, when we read it in the scriptures especially, we read that word and we go, oh, okay, that's you know saying something bad against the Lord. Right? Using the Lord's name in vain or something. That's really not what this word means here. And it's not exclusively what this Greek word means, but it's evil speaking about anybody. Oh. Oh. And then you call it blasphemy. Oh. Man. Boy, this one can get real close to home. Because we can speak evil of people in the nicest ways. We can speak evil of people as an introduction to trying to get somebody to gather with us to, let's pray for this person. You know why? You know what they're doing. You know what's going on. And away it goes. Speaking evil. One of the things I tell young couples in premarital counseling is it, it hurts my heart, literally. But it's happened lots of times, and I'll bet it's happened to you guys too, where you're at work and you're in some public place and a man or a woman is speaking about their husband or wife and they're speaking evil things. They're tearing them down in some way. They're ridiculing them. They're maligning them. They're not there, but they're ridiculing them. What an idiot they are. That is so wrong. And that is so out of place for a believer. But you know what? It's out of place not just for your husband or wife. It's especially out of place there. But for your brother or sister, we're family. You don't get to go wagging your tail, wagging your tongue about your brothers and sisters. No. You don't get to do it. It's blasphemy is the word from the Greek, blasphemy. Put it off. Put it off. Filthy language. Pretty obvious. Keep the filthy language out of your mouth. No, put it off. Put it off. Verse 9 literally says, stop lying to one another. It's speaking about an action that is ongoing currently. In the, in the Greek tense and so forth. Stop lying to each other. Stop lying to yourself. Right? Since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And it's interesting that this gets plugged in here, but I think it's because it's sometimes the source of some of the evil speaking and the blasphemy and all the other things that he just identified, the anger and the wrath and the filthy language out of your mouth. Hey, you've been, you're putting on the new man who's renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. Race, cultural background, language, color of skin, any one of those things, today are still motivators for lying and speaking evil of others. Hey, Christ blew all of those categories out in the kingdom of God. There is no black. There is no white. There is no brown in the kingdom of God. We are all His and we, are all, we all stand before Him at equal uh, levels in the sight of God. We can't let that seep in in, in in the slightest amount. So there's a principle in, in trying to live the Christian life and that is if, if there's a particular um, difficulty you have and, and 
probably the best example of this and where I've used it the most, but beyond, uh, is in uh, addictive behavior for those who, who suffer from substance abuse. And when, when you are freed from substance abuse, um, I've told people that you know it's easy, quote unquote, to get clean. It's hard to live clean. It's hard to stay clean. And, and it genuinely is. It's a whole radical change of life. And, and here's what has to happen. After you're taken out, okay, and now here you are. And imagine I'm right here, and over here is, is my old life and, and all of the drugs I used to take. And uh, I say, okay, I don't want to go over there anymore. I used to live over there, but I'm living over here now. I'm not going over there. So when I, I know what I'll do. I'll build a wall. I'll build a wall here so that I can't get over there, which is an important thing to do in any of our lives where we have a particular besetting sin. We need to set things in place to keep us from going there. The anger, the wrath, the malice, the lying, any one of these struck home with you. Okay, it's an entirely appropriate thing to say, okay, I'm going to set up a wall here. I'm going to keep myself from that. But you know what you'll do? I'm going to get close to that wall. I'm going to Sit on top of that wall. I'm not crossing over. Whatever barrier you put up, you'll find a way to get around it sooner or later. If your focus is on, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I used to do that, but I'm not going to do that now. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that because I know what that is. I'm not going to do that. You see, where's the focus? Where have you set your mind? It's consumed with that. I'm not going to do it. And then you end up in Romans 7. That which I will to do, I don't do. And that which I will not to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Right? Here's the thing. We don't stay focused here. Build the wall, absolutely. Whatever it takes to stay away from there. And now, turn your attention this way. Turn your attention unto the Lord. Turn your attention unto those things which the Lord has given you to do away from that. Jesus tells a story about a man who was delivered of a demon and uh, a demon went roaming around looking for someplace else to go and couldn't find it and came back to the original person. And he says he found his, his heart clean but empty. So he took seven others worse than himself and they all possessed him again. I don't think that story is exclusively applicable to demon possession. I think it's entirely applicable to how we live our lives and how we live our changed lives. If all we do is stop something and we don't fill ourselves with something, we'll just constantly be in this battle and we will lose and win back and forth and back and forth what god wants us to do is to put off the old man be renewed that's a passive action that's something god does to us we can't renew ourselves he renews us and then put on the new man and that's the third thing that paul talks about right here right verse 12 therefore as the elect of god holy and beloved already it's already a fact. Not trying to seek to become holy or seek to be loved because you're already holy, because you're already the beloved of the Lord. Put on these things. Tender mercies. I love that because you know what? I know how to be merciful in the nastiest way. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. No. Tender mercies. Kindness. Humility, meekness, not to be confused with weakness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. Oh, you really mean I'm supposed to suffer long, not just suffer long, but bear with people. I love what 1 Corinthians 13 says in describing what love is. It says it is long-suffering and kind. You can be long-suffering and not be kind at all about your long-suffering. But what true love, what agape does in our hearts is long-suffering and kind, bearing with one another. If anyone has 
a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Ooh, that puts it in perspective, doesn't it? We've been forgiven. What right do we have to have a complaint against somebody else? But above all these things, not instead of, but kind of overseeing it all, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Or the word there for perfection could be translated completion. It's the bond that completes it all, that makes it perfect. I love this next one, verse 15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You don't understand, Pastor. I'm an anxious person. That's just the way I am. He's telling us what we have the ability to put off and put on. And he says, let the peace of God rule. That doesn't mean there won't be things fighting against the peace of God in your life. But he says, let the peace of God rule. Let it be the ultimate authority. Let it be the one that drives all the other emotions. Peace with God. We have peace with God. Having been justified, we have peace with God, Paul tells us in Romans 5. Wow. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. You ought to use that word, thanks be to God, or praise God. You ought to use that at least a dozen times a day. That's at minimum. That should just flow out of your mouth. You should be able to say that in front of anybody. You don't have to hold it in. It's not illegal to say praise God. Just like that, praise God. Yeah. And that should be our response to life in this world and what God has done in us, for us, around us. It's not, well, it would have been better if this, or well, it's my time. Or, Praise God. Praise God. One of, my, uh, one of my mentors in the faith, Pastor Chuck Smith, um, was wonderful about this, in, in, especially as I came to know him in his older age. He was... Um, farther along I didn't know him as a young man I didn't know him well but I had the chance to hang out with him at least maybe almost half a dozen times where I got to sit and talk with him not just you know be in the same room with he and 500 other people and one of the things I noticed about him was that was his response so often to whatever anything anybody said to him to tell him about something even if it was something that, you know, you might expect him to say, well, that's pretty good, but you know what the Scripture says, and the guy knew the Scriptures. But instead, he would always start with, oh, well, bless God. Bless God. And I found that that's the nature that God wants to put in us, that we are thankful that that's our nature. We are thankful. Bless God. Yeah, maybe it's not quite perfect and maybe there's more to be done and maybe all of those other things but first and foremost thank you lord thank you lord scripture says to be thankful in all things for this is the will of god in christ jesus for you and then let the word of christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching admonishing one another psalms hymns spiritual songs sing with grace in your hearts to the lord and whatever you do in word or deed in whatever you do do it in the name of the lord jesus you know you watch a cop show they used to do this say this all the time i i actually don't hear that much anymore because maybe it's not a respected phrase but i can remember in cop shows as a kid the police were chasing somebody and and the person was running the, the cop would say stop stop in the name of the law and somehow that you know, sometimes that would speaking with the authority. That's what we're to be doing in everything that we do, whether it's by what we say or what we do. We're supposed to be doing all in the name of our Lord, in the authority of him and surrounding his name. Put his name on what you're doing and saying and see how that affects what you do and say. In the name of the Lord. Wow. <laughs> it might change a few things, huh? For us all hey we're all on a journey here and none of us has this down 
perfectly. But we all want to keep aiming towards Him. Keep on that journey towards Him. Forgetting what is behind. Focusing on what is ahead before us. That's where we want to be going. And along the way, we want to be gathering brothers, sisters, in any way that we can to be successful in that journey as we all put on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is really what we're doing in putting on the new man. Let's pray. Father, thank You that You give us, You change us, You give us the will to follow You, and You give us the ability. The Lord, as the Scriptures say in another place, we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And that's what this is about, this putting on the new man, is this working it out, figuring it out. How do I put off the things in my life that you have called us that we ourselves are to put off? And how do I put on these things in their place? How do I put away anger and malice and wrath and put on tender mercies and kindness and gentleness and humility? Lord, we need to be taught, just like a young child needs to be taught how to put on clothes, we need to be taught how to put this on. And I thank you that your Spirit has come and dwells in us specifically to teach us how to walk in this world by following you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us as we walk through this world to call upon your name to listen for your voice, to look in your word, to seek the wisdom and knowledge from your word, to know how to do this putting off and putting on. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless and keep you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Hmm. May he make his face shine upon you with the grace that pours forth from His countenance and bless and keep you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.